Okay, so welcome everyone, and especially welcome to our lecturer for today, Alexandra Silvero. Uh, today we are focusing on jazz and Alexandra Silvero's thoughts and ideas about how to practice and to play jazz, especially as a bassoonist. Uh, he will also present his book named uh, The Blues Scales, uh, which is a guide how to practice and improvise for the bassoon. This is a topic I think we're all looking forward to hear and learn more about. Uh, before we start, I would just like to say that in the Zoom meeting that you're watching uh, are currently mostly students of Arik and I, and uh, also former students of the Music Academy in Post 9. There will, however, also be more people joining <clears throat> the Zoom meeting as we speak, uh, as you can probably see already. Uh, since this time, we decided to uh, make the link for the Zoom meeting public. So just to make some few things clear, uh, all the new members will be muted in the start. Uh, but of course, everyone are welcome to unmute themselves and participate with the questions in the end if you have something you want to ask. Um, if you at home who are watching this on Facebook Live would also be interested in joining this meeting as you see on the screen here now, then uh, take a look in the comment section of this live video. I will soon post a link there for the meeting so you can be in the video as well. Uh, unfortunately, there is a limit for how many people who can be in the same Zoom meeting at once. So if you are not able to enter, uh, but would still like to ask us or uh, Silverio a question, please just write your question here in the live chat on Facebook and we will include it at the very end of the lecture. So finally, after having been talking a lot, <laughs> then I would love to welcome our main guest, Alessandro Silverio. How are you, man? Welcome to the show. Hey, hello. Hello, Hola. everyone. Hello, guys. <laughs> hello, nice creature. Oh, nice to see you. Joe, uh, thank you very much for, for this invitation to be part of this interview. It's great to be here, man. Thank you very much. And congratulations for the initiative in this quarantine time where a lot of us are alone, to, alone in home, but here we are alone together. <laughs> yes, I'm very thankful that you're joining us. Oh, thank you too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know he, some people here. Joanne Sukumaran. Joanne, hello, sir. <laughs> she was a member of my website, the Basun Lesson, and we we know we know us because the was and Facebook and internet. That is the good thing about the internet on, on nowadays. Eh? And she has a good uh, podcast as well. Yes, 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 yes. Fantastic. <laughs> so, Alessandra, I think we are all very curious to hear about your book. Do you have it here with you? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, that is my... My first book, actually, né? the Blues Case for Bassoon. The unfortunately, the printed version is uh, is not more. Uh, it's sold out. I sold. I printed about two hundred of them, but it, it was fast sold out. But the download version is possible to to find it on my website, which is Alexandre. Alexandrosilvério.com. I don't. I think people don't understand my my name when I when I speak Alexandre. Maybe it's good, a good idea would be to write, man. Alexandrosilvério.com. Yeah, that is the that's Great. the link. Mm -hmm. It's possible to find that there and download the. Ah, I will share it that in the screen later. Later, okay. And this book it has a lot, about about hundred twenty pages, and I decided to do a book using the blues case because the blues is the root of the jazz. Yeah? The blues is the blues scale is one of the most important scales for the jazzist. And because the jazz, the, the, the blues is the base of the jazz, I think it's a good start for any bassoonist who wants to play jazz. 
Uh, because yes, because I'll, there are a lot of of jazz books when you when you look when you search something for for to learn to improvise, but in general these books are too much theoretic, uh, too much theory in the in the beginning, and that it's uh, how to say that makes that that scare that scare people when you too much when you just when you are trying to play jazz you are looking to have fun uh, when you just look too much towards things you you are it makes you scare and in general you you don't don't continue to to study jazz that is the reason that i i made this book this book is it's more to have fun starting to play in the, the, the blues and the blue scales. And yes, the first part of the book is for you to learn and memorize the blue scales. Second part of the book, there are some exercises to learn how to develop, how to create phrases. Eh? And there are a part of the book, the third part, I think, uh, which includes playbacks. There are some playback tracks. For example, I will, I will share with you uh, a playback track, okay? Yes, uh, please do. Are you able to... <clears throat> there you go. To this, for example. Uh, are you listening something? Not. Uh, I just made you the host, so now you can uh, share your screen if you have something you want to show us. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, let's stop. That's the book. I'm sharing my screen for you. Are you seeing something? Yeah, it's perfect. That's the cover of the book. And as, as I said, as I said, the first part are exercises for you to learn and master in the blues case. And very simple. I can show you if you want. Oh, yes, please do. We are very <laughs> interested. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. First is very easy yeah. to not scare someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just as as you can see, the first is just just a, a blue scale, open and down. Eh? The second one, are you listening to that? Yeah, yeah, we hear you very well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then this the next exercise, just when, until the the blue note. Né? Yes, the the blue scale is very, very similar to the minor pentatonic. That's the minor pentatonic. And the blue scale. Yes, that, that note has a special color, a special flavor of, of sound. Yes, in the next, next pages, in another keys. I transpose them because when you learn from a jazz book, in general, it's hard because they they give the first example, then they say, okay, now transpose to the 12 keys. <laughs> it makes you it makes you scared. It's good hard. luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good luck. <laughs> and that is the moment that you uh, how to say you um, is this the, the, 
is the moment when you don't con- when you give up. <laughs> That's the moment when you give up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, but here is transposed transposed for all 12 keys. Né? For example, E flat minor blues key. Né? Oh, this chair is uncomfortable. Etc. It continue. It continues. Né? That's good because you can learn and memorize all the twelve blues case. And then the second part of the book. Ah, there are me- sorry. There are me- uh, more exercises uh, to memorize the blues case, like this, for example, exercise four, which are shuffle written yeah, in triplets. This is this is in the blues the blues harmony, same chord change the, the blues. Continuous. There are a lot of exercises here in six four, that was just a blue scale. Second part of the book, uh, where is creating phrases with blue scale. Uh, I give some ideas here of how can you develop the phrases. Right? For example, the this first example, I just played four first notes of the blue scale. And then I continue, I continue with the other notes of the blue scale. It, yeah. it could be, for example. There are some exercises here for you to try to create your own phrases. Yeah. I will try to resume a little bit more. Yeah, here is the section where you can play with playbacks. For example, hmm. there are about 10, 10 tracks with playbacks here in this book with some exercises. Exercises, I will choose, for example, a G minor, a G minor blues, okay? Just just to show a little bit how, how it works. Uh, slow tempo. Are you listening to, to the playback? The song? Uh, I pause it now. I cannot hear anything. No. Nope. Mm, just a second. Mm. Ah, yes, I need to, to add something here. Now you're here. Just a second. Now it will work. Perfect. Yes. Yes, that is an example of playback that is included in the book. E minor, E minor blues. 
Yes, and easier the size here, it will be it will be, it will be here. <laughs> This is his exercise for this, this hit music. Okay. Example 12. Are you seeing the example 12 here? Right. It's great, it's great. I will start with the exercise. Continues, repeats each chord, eh? and there are, for example, here is the example, the ex example, and the this part is the exercise which you should do in the same way as the example. And here, for example, something more advanced. I wrote this exercise. I wrote this is an exercise in the book with eight notes. Yeah. For example, this. Are you seeing the, the parts? Eh? Okay. Yes, yes, we both Sorry see and hear everything very well. <laughs> ah, okay, sort to ask that all the time. <laughs> no, no check. Yeah, and if, in the, if I play with the playback, this example, for, and now I will show you, I will show you the example, the played example, and then I will do a free improvisation using half notes, quarter notes, everything. Eight, eight notes, but not think too much, thinking too much in the rhythm, just playing, okay? But uh, always using the blue scale. That is the, ah, that's the main thing here. You, you work on this book with the blue scale. With the blue scale, the blues harmony and the exercises you should do using the blue scale. This example for, uh, the example number 15, I, it's using only the A minor blue scale. <laughs> if you check the notes, you will not see that there are just the notes of the E minor blue scale. <laughs>
Pause in the example. Oh, wow, sounded really nice. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. A little bit, uh, how to say, uh, uh, too low, too loud, maybe. Eh? With no, the not at all. No? Okay. No, it's great. <laughs> Don't worry. A little bit distorted, maybe, distorted with the mic, no? Well, of course, it's always better live <laughs> in person. <laughs> okay. But don't oh, worry. I'm, I'm like hosting here, uh, Christian. Yes. Yeah, you are. And I, I know there are some people this. who wants to join the meeting. So maybe we can switch and then we will start the Q&A here. How can I switch this? this? Uh, you can do this. Like... I can just do it. <laughs> there okay. we are. Okay, good evening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think there are many people who would like to ask you some questions here. Okay, great. Uh, so maybe, um, Carolina, you want to be the first one. So I hope everybody can hear me. Yeah. Um, well, we know that you're not only a, a jazz bassoonist, but you're also an orchestra player. Uh, do you find it actually uh, hard to switch between being an orchestra musician and a jazz bassoonist, do you actually have time for that? And yeah, what do you find the most challenging? <coughs> yes. <coughs> Sorry. It's actually a very good question. Very good question. It's, it's really hard to have time to do both things. Really hard. But I, I always try what I do, for example, uh, in, my, in my situation, as you as you said, I am or orchestra playing. My orchestra has usually three concerts every week. We, but I I play just fifty percent. There are another colleague that alternate with me. We are, we are two principals, two principal bassoon here. We are five bassoons in the section. Eh? And yes, then I usually I play two weeks in the orchestra, then I have two weeks free. But I teach a lot here in Sao Paulo. And yes, it's, it's hard. And I have my family, my wife, and my daughter too. My daughter is just two years. Uh, my daughter is here. I have a picture of her. Actually, she's playing there. But I said, oh, stay, stay at South. Uh, please stay outside, outside, because it will be hard to to speak and give attention for you now. She is very electric. Yes, my my daughter, <laughs> Melissa. Yes, yes. It's hard. It changed a lot now with time to organize my time. But I always try to be very organized. Um, for example, I do the basic stuff. Every day with bassoon, uh, long tones, scales, arpe uh, chords, arpeggios, right? and that, then I play a little bit of orchestral sets. I always try to be playing Mozart concert and some some classical pieces. Then, in the end part of my daily routine, I practice I practice jazz. I could say that 70% of my practice is classical classical music and third percent jazz. I do this. And also to be motivated to play, I always try to, to book concert, jazz concerts for me to play in the jazz clubs. Usually in, in general, I play every, every two months. Every two months, I have a concert of jazz because it's too hard to play a concert jazz. You play, you play the stand two hours, and it's it's really hard. It's really hard to play like solist two hours, a lot of repertoire and with people playing loud uh, behind you. Oh, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. 
but I I force myself to to be always playing jazz. No? It's important. Another thing is to convince the jazz club jazz club owners when you say to them, "Oh, please uh, book a, a date for me. I would like to play your jazz club." Okay, what do I play? Ah, I play basso. Basso. Basso is not a jazz instrument. Please go out. <laughs> It's, it's something crazy, but now they they know they know me even more. And when I started to negotiate, the, the date is a little bit crazy. But okay, I think it's becoming becoming more and more common that bassoonists are playing jazz in the world. Even more bassoonists are playing jazz in the world. Thanks to you inspiring them, I think, also. <laughs> Great question. Okay, uh, Arik, I think you have one as well, right? Yes, I do have a question. Alexandra, would you like to tell us a little bit about your studies in Europe with Klaus Tunemann? How yes. you, what your impressions and memories are and how this basics, the most classical basics, affected your jazz playing? Yes, very good question too. Yes, uh, Tunima is for me, even now, even, even today, most big thing, the biggest thing, uh, inspiration for me as bassoonist. Fantastic, fantastic. And what uh, what inspired me to, to continue to play jazz is about the sound, certainly about the sound. Uh, I remember once that I was having a class with Klaus Tunemann and we were playing a Vivaldi concert, Vivaldi concert. Then I, I was a little bit afraid because a lot of people in Brazil said, oh, be careful, you, you, you go to play to the German people, maybe they don't, they don't like jazz music. <laughs> Maybe they are very, very conservative. Be careful. Okay, they, they have. To, I was very, very careful, very careful with Klaus. I, I, I was very careful to to show him that I play jazz. I want. I don't want to mention this. But in this class of Vivaldi, he was just like, Ah, Alexandre, look this this harmony. This harmony is ah, this fantastic harmony, and actually, a lot of people say that jazz began, jazz started in the 19th century, but that is not true. The jazz began much earlier. Vivaldi was also was already doing doing the jazz harmonies. They he showed the same harmony of this Vivaldi concert. That was the same harmony of a jazz standard, very no uh, autumn leaves. And then he, he was, uh, how to say, Sorry, uh, he was happy, he was, uh, he was excited with the jazz and he continued playing on piano, the jazz harmony, uh, like a, Yeah, he was playing, and then I noticed, oh man, this this man like he likes to play jazz. Then I started to provide with him, and then I was shocked. <laughs> but in the end of the of of this jam session, Klaus looked at me and and he gives his typical look. <laughs> it's like like that. Then, very fun, very fun. Yes, they, yes. I, I think the, what stayed with me was is this thing that Klaus Tunemann plays the bassoon, a melodic instrument, but thinking harmonic, a master of harmony. And I think all of us that plays melodic instrument, we should care more about this and, and to see the big screen, to understand the overall context of the music, you know? and yeah, that that's what I what I learned with Klaus Tunemann. 
one of the things, of course. Of course. Very nice question, a nice answer. I'm just curious myself, uh, did his way of um, teaching basics, you know, scales and chords and how to repeat this, did that affect a little bit the way you wrote the jazz book? Because it's, or the blues book, sorry, because it's also quite academic. Yeah, yeah maybe, uh -huh. yeah, it can be, I, I don't think about, I never thought about, the, about that. Because I, I I was I was just wondering because I just wondered uh, there are some exercises in there that it's it's one melody and then it is transposing to another tonality and then another tonality and it's uh, also a little bit like Tuneman style to have one bar and then you play it in every tonality and I was just curious. <laughs> yes, yes, it makes sense. Yes, to. Every every key should be to us like C major. Né? You are playing F sharp major, but it should be so easy as C major, for example. Né? Exactly. Wait, exactly. Né? And you, when are you playing jazz and improvise? It should be read like that because the chord changes are something. In some tunes are really hard. Yeah. For example, the this tune, the take five, take five. Do -de -do 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 -de -do 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 -de -do I wrote the arrangement in E flat E flat minor, which is the original key of of Paul Desmond. Paul Desmond wrote in E flat minor, and a lot of a lot of bassoonists ask me later, oh, because you wrote in E flat minor, that is so hard. Why not E minor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they answered, man, E flat major, E flat minor is a sound, it's a very special sound. I think bassoon sounds very good with the flat keys. Then I decided to, to Continue using E flat minor, and I think it sounds good. Oh, absolutely, absolutely! I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mateusz, you have some questions, I think. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sure. Hello, Hello. Mateusz. Yeah, so my question is about uh, mistakes that uh, people who begin to improvise are making? What are the most common mistakes what we should avoid when we are starting improvising? Yeah, actually the chord changes and to, to, to read chord changes is very important and to, to play clean. You started to improvise, one of the most things to learn in the beginning is to, to you, you read a chord change, you, you read an expressive chord, you instantly you tra 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 translate to our, your instrument, but you don't have time to think too much this. Then the, the scales, all, all the scales, you need to know very well to be automatic. To, it must to be auto, auto, <laughs> how to say, how to say autom automated. Automatically, yeah. Automatically. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Yeah. And that's and also the form. Beginners lost the form. To learn the form, you need to listing a lot. Listing a lot, listing a lot. When, for example, I, I need to learn a new tune to play, first thing that I, I do is play without playback. I play, I just try to learn the melody. And then after I, I check the chords and I try to identify if he, I know all the, all the scales of some specific chords. There are some, some, some chord, how to say, 
There are some cards that are harder than others. For example, C, let, like for example, C7, flat nine, and sharp fifth. Now it makes you sometimes crazy then that you be that you need to know which which scale you should use for this a specific chord né? and then just after to learn all the chord changes i go to the playback the way i play in the playback i start by listing the playback a, a lot of times then i try to play the, with the playback that's basically what i do then when i do this i learn the form when you know the form you are when you know the form and the chords, you will be able to improvise more with more confidence. I hope it was a little what you asked me, Matheus. Yeah, sure. Thanks. You're welcome. <clears throat> and uh, I think you have uh, another one, Matheus, right? <clears throat> Just go for it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um... I would also like to ask uh, who's your one of the favorites uh, jazz players nowadays? Like, okay. Yeah. For now, né? nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I started listing a lot of Charlie Parker and Coltrane and Miles, and even nowadays I listen to them a lot, a lot. More Coltrane, I think, but I like a lot to listen to Oscar Peterson, the pianist, and Herbie Hancock, of course, and Ron Carter, the bassist, is my idol, fantastic, very elegant. He, he plays very elegant with very nice sound and so swing. Winton Marsalis is my idol. <laughs> For me, Winton is like close to them. <laughs> And he can also play classic as well. So yes, exactly. He, exactly. He plays classic and very well classic and jazz. And what I, li I like in his style is that he, he plays with a nice and robust sound. Né? Sound is the most important aspect of the playing an instrument, I think. Yeah. Then Winton Marsalis, uh, Branford Marsalis, his brother, saxophonist. I used to listen a lot to the saxophonist, but now I'm trying to go a little bit out of sax. I don't want to, I don't want to be too much influenced by the saxophone. I was a lot, I confess, but now I'm trying to expand. Okay. And Eric Alexander, Tenor sax. <laughs> mm. uh, what else? Uh, mm. Yes, I I also like to to listen trumpeters uh, uh, beyond Marsalis and Roy Hargrove, who who is Roy Hargrove, and yeah, there are a lot of many good players nowadays. But I think the top that what. Uh, I listen at Morris Eric Alexander now. Very very nice sound. And improvises very good. <clears throat> Great. Good question. <laughs> Carolina. Uh, actually, I wanted to follow that question, and uh, you said, "What are your favorite jazz musicians?" But. Do you also listen to classical music? And what would you recommend us to, to listen? Who is your favorite uh, performer? Yes, for me, I even now I listen a lot to Klaus Tunemann when I go to the bassoon. I like these recordings of him. I always have here, yeah, right here. I, I heard this. A lot, probably you all. <laughs> yes, I fantastic CD. Né? It's old. I bought this in nineteen ninety three, I think. Yes, Klaus Tunemann. Uh, 
I, I don't listen too much to the classic, I, I should confess. I listen to Yo-Yo Ma, Berlin Philharmonic, I always listen to them. And the pianist, Arkady Volodos, I really like his playing. And it's like Pelman, but I don't listen too much. Uh, because I play a lot of classical music, you know? and I, when I was in Berlin, I remember that I, when I, I in Berlin, be, beyond Klaus Tunemann, I also stu I studied in the Kalin Academy you know, of the Berlin Philharmonic. Then I remember that I was always practicing there. And when I had pause, ah, okay, now I will go up, go up, uh, go above, and I will listen. Yeah, maybe the Philharmonic, they, maybe they are rehearsal. That, that was very common, right? <laughs> so good. I have also one, another question, a bit more specific uh, for bassoonists. Uh, do the reads you perform? Classical music and the uh, jazz music, do they uh, vary? Are those the same reads or do you play different reads every kind of repertoire? Mm -hmm. Yes, in, in the, it's a, li a little bit different. When you are playing jazz, the bass plays loud. Uh, just a drums is enough to, to kill you. In the orchestra, I, I play with very soft uh, reeds because the, the hall has a nice acoustic. And our conductor, uh, actually we have a now conductor now, but the, the last conductor, she, uh, she was Mary Elsop. Uh, uh, she was always, oh, bassoon, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Don't know why. Uh, not only bassoons, the all the wind sections. Oh, less, 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 less. Then I developed this so, very soft reeds for the orchestra, but for just playing, my my reeds are, are harder, harder. But it's the same kind of I scrape uh, I scrape the reeds in the same way, same sound, man. But just bigger. Just, it's, it's more uh, like a solist read. Solist read is for this. Thank you. Good to know. I was curious about that as well. Uh, <laughs> Johan, you have something? Uh, yeah. Hi, Alexander. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Johan. Nice hi, to hi. See you. Yeah, thanks for sharing your setup on uh, YouTube the other day. Uh, oh, yeah. Nice. yeah, I have a question about improvisation and uh, composing, right? So I am not really a person to sit down and write out uh, the notes on the score. Uh, usually I, I get some ideas in the moment, right? And then the, usually it will sound a little bit crazy, but I, I, I sing into my phone like onto the voice memo, right? And then later I try to go back to the idea and try to bring it to the bassoon. But should I write it out also on paper? Uh, because in some sense, I'm a little bit limited by a very short idea then. I don't know. Yes, that, that would be good because uh, yeah. the, our goal is to, to play as we sing. Right? Yeah. For example, a lot of, we, we are, uh, practicing jazz, there are a lot of jazzists that, that, that practice just singing, singing, singing and playing, singing and playing. But maybe in the, be in the beginning it can be difficult. A good solution is to write and improvise in the beginning. We start in, because when you write something, it's something that is in your mind, in your in, in your ears, your your body. You know? It's it's an improv. It's already an improvisation, but it's written with the the practice, daily practice. It become it becomes more natural. Then after a time, you will be able to improvise with 
provides it well, good, without to write something, you know. I, I already did a lot in the beginning. I remember that one of the first lessons that I had, the teacher said to me, oh, write uh, and improvise and play this with the playback. Then I showed him the next class. Okay, then now, okay. Uh, next step is to sing in a short phrase and to play the same phrase on, on your instrument. If you are not able to play in your instrument yet, it, it, uh, it means that you should write yet the, what, you say, what you say. Did you understand what I said? So confused, sorry. <laughs> More or less. We understood everything, don't worry. Really? Oh, thank you. You have a Google Translator for my mind, really. <laughs> yes, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have another question here as well from one of our guests. Uh, I will probably pronounce your name very badly. I'm very sorry, but uh, uh, George or Jose, oh, no, what is it? Lopez? <laughs> sorry, <George laughs> bear with Lopez. me, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we cannot hear you currently. Two seconds. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, perfect. Hi, everyone. Hi, Alessandro Sibelo. I am a uh, fan of your work. Uh, sorry for my English. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, I like your playing because you are a jazz bassoonist uh, who play uh, with the original sound of bassoon, and it's important. Uh, for me, um, and what is your opinion about uh, bassoonists who play in uh, saxophone? And if you think that uh, this question influence um, the, the mature or the mode piece uh, when play bassoon? Do you understand me? <laughs> yes, Claire. Hello, oh, George. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? From Spain? From Spain, yes, yes. Ah, nice. Yeah. Okay, nice question too. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, there were a time that I was thinking to buy a saxophone, tenor sax, to uh -huh. play with big bands. And, but then I think I uh, totally. Uh, I, I, I thought I thought I thought too much about that because if I bought a, if I bought a saxophone, maybe it could be a very big influence on my sound on bassoon, and maybe it could change my mind and because. A lot of players say that saxophone is much easier to play jazz uh, than the bassoon. Okay, it's much easier. Then I, I, I just thought, okay, I will stay with bassoon. I will force myself to not buy a basso, uh, saxophone. And why, why I thought to buy a saxophone? Because the sound it will be easier to, be, to play in the big band. But that was much, much years ago, much many years ago, actually, uh, because I, I didn't have a good uh, amplification for my bassoon. I was having a lot of trouble, problem, a lot of problems with the amplification because uh, when you play with just band, usually they are very, they, they commonly play with saxophone and trumpet they, they know they know they know this situation very very well but when they play with bassoon they think that bassoon is the same then they play heavy and you say no no less less and they ah oh, why less more less play, play loud play loud <laughs> that was like a, a fight man they but that was good that uh, it was good that I don't bought a saxophone that because I pursued 
my search of how to amplify the bassoon properly. And I think I found it. Now I play with the band without problem. I can play with big band and quite, uh, jazz quintet without problem. I don't have problem to play with them. And of course, when focusing, focusing in only one instrument, you have more chance to play it better. Né? If mm -hmm. I divide my time with this saxophone, I think it's, for me, it, it will not work. Mm -hmm. And yeah, also okay. regarding amplifying instruments, I saw you made a video, Alexandre, quite recently on YouTube about this, right? Yes, exactly. Last week it was. So I would really recommend everyone to check that out. It's really great. It's over one hour, I think. It's a lot of content there. <laughs> yeah, In two languages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, and then we got another question here. Um, hi, um, let me see. Uh, yeah, can you talk us through your warm up routine? Warm up routine? Yeah, it's very simple. I start slow with long tones. I like to do long tones to have always good uh, embouchure and good sound, eh? to have control of my sound. I Usually do about five or ten minutes of long tones, but sometimes I start different. There are sometimes that I don't to play uh, again the same exercise of, of long tones. Then I start playing bass lines, bass lines. Very simple. It's another, another warm up. But actually, just to, sp to, to play slowly, something slowly. But for sound, I think the most, the best thing is to do long, long tone exercise like this. I do this fast. Every, every day. Yeah, things like that, man. I spend about 10 minutes, the major scale, then arpeggios. I don't. I don't do a very long uh, warm up, just about half hour. It's enough, other flow. No, no, it's answered perfectly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, yes. Good to know. There are more questions coming in now from uh, the live stream here. Uh, they ask, uh, what kind of microphone do you use for recordings and where do you place the microphone to get a good sound? Yes, for for recordings, I usually use this microphone. This is a AKG. How to say this? AKG. Maybe it's better if I show. It's possible to see anything here? Uh, no, it's not working. Sorry. AKG. AKG. 1214, 14. C214, AKG C214. It's very good microphone. It's a condenser microphone. I like to, to position this mic in, in this part for home recording, like this, this distance, about, about one, met, one meter from the bassoon. Not right in the bell, right in the bell is bad. I think like more like that in this part. And for my CD, the Inter Mundos, I don't know if you know, but it's there in Spotify and you can find my CD. Uh, this CD I recorded with two mics. 
two mics. It was one in this position and the another mic uh, near to, to, closer to this part, okay? It was, uh, this was, um, uh, the first mic was a mic like this. And the second mic was a mic from Electro Voice, RE20. -E I, use, I use this mic a lot. It's very good. It has a nice sound. Actually, yeah, basic, basically is, is that for home record, recording, just one mic is enough. And for a studio, two. And then and with the bassoon ensemble as well, do you use two mics? For the bassoon ensemble? Yeah. For the bassoon ensemble, you have uh, two mics, but condenser mics. For the videos you, you are asking, eh? Yeah, the, the stuff that you have on YouTube with the ensemble. Yes, we use it two, two mics, condensers. And yes, just that actually. Well, it sounds it great. Sounds not bad, eh? <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and yeah, if you have time for a few questions more. Yes, please. Um, so let me see. Uh, many jazz players asked about which music from the 20th century is the most similar to jazz. Um, for example, you know, such as Johann Sebastian Bach is was also improvisated many of his pieces. Uh, what do you think about this? Um, so I guess the the similarity between jazz and, for example, baroque, where they were both improvising a lot. Ah, yes, it's very, it's very close. It's very, how to say, connect. It's very connected. As you know, Ba was a was an improviser. He was a jazz a jazz player of the 80th centuries. <laughs> Improvised with very, very amazing harmonies, and yes, it, it's. Like I told you in the private lesson here, uh, jazz improvisation is, is the art of composing in, in real time. Né? If you use the same technique that the classical composers use, it's the same, it's the better, better thing to do. Better thing to do. And yes, bah, the music of Bach is a good, very, very important reference for us to study how he developed uh, an idea, how he work, how he works with the motifs and etc. Né? You should patch this and study this all the time. I think this is a very important, and I think it's actually a pity that uh, we sort of lost that ability, if you want. Uh, along the way, like you say, Bach, Beethoven, all the big composers, yeah, to improvise was part of the job. <laughs> but today, yes. classical musicians, we have no idea. And that is something I really envy with many jazz musicians. You can just go to any place, meet some people and just, okay, hey, let's play something. You don't rehearse, you don't have any music, you can just play. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> so we have a lot to learn from jazz there, I think. Okay, another one. Um, how would you recommend practicing the walking bass on the bassoon? Walking bass, uh, relaxed, slowly, in the low register, and imitating a bass, eh? always, always imitating a bass. Actually, we showed listening a lot to to, to, to the jazz recordings to learn. Eh? When you listen a lot to the recordings is, when, when you listen a lot to the recordings, you can list, uh, learn a lot of them. Eh? And yes, and listen a lot to the, the bass players, how, how they do. Eh? Maybe transcribe some of the bass line that, that they make. And when play a tune, a blues, it's always good to play slowly you know, with the metronome. Uh, slowly, for example, in a tempo 
relax in temp. I like to put the metrum like this. It's 60 p BPM, né? Slowly, né? Relax. This is two and four. One, two, three, four. One, more imitating a uh, bass actually né? when I'm practicing I always checking myself in my head oh I'm sounding closer to the bass I'm trying to imagine a bass né? it's basically that that's great uh, another question here um you have answered it in a private session with us earlier, but just to make it on Facebook as well. Um, how long time did it take for you to get comfortable to play jazz in the public since you probably started with classical? Yes, 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 yes. I started, I started playing classical, yeah, class, of course, in orchestra, né? but in, in how to say, young, young orchestra, né? I started playing, of course. But after my begin with, with the jazz studies, I think two years ago, I started to, to create a band. Two years ago, because I, yes, it took a lot of time, not too much, but uh, not, not too much, but in the middle, eh? uh, about some years, some, more than a year to memorize the scales and and to learn a lot of tunes and to be able to improvise. Né? Nowadays, I, for example, I I think I know from memory about two hundred jazz tunes memorized. Oh, wow! Yes, it should be. <laughs> yes, the melody and the harmony. When you are able to do this in both. Yeah, it's, it takes time, yeah. but I think at least two years it's enough to. It's like a language, you, know? you to be to have confidence to speak a language. A language, it it's not in, in just six months. You know? It it needed to really apply your time uh, for a, for a time for maybe like two hours per day in two years. Yeah, it can be, it, be, it, it can work to play jazz, I think. Great. And also I, I was just wondering actually, um, one question for me because I have been focusing on classical music my whole life ever since I started to play bassoon. Uh, and now I'm starting a little bit more on jazz because I have the feeling that as a classical musician, when you think technique, you can get very metronomic, very static, very, yeah, very rhythmical. But do you feel with jazz that you sort of free up a bit more? You come a bit more relaxed and you can play faster things, just more chill in a way. It's not so. Uh. Yes, very, very good question. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right, uh, Christian. You are right that it helps a lot. It helps too much. Now in my situation, for example, one of the reasons that I also decided to play jazz was to, to make my fingers freer because I remember that I was too much focusing Weber concert and this all class, classical stuff. And I had the uh, Tenjinichi, how, how, how's the name? Tenjinichi. Tendonitis, tendonitis in the finger. I had problem. Is it possible to understand this word? Tendonitis? No. <clears throat> Sorry, yes, yes, yes. Tendonitis. Don't worry. Ah, okay. I had this. 
Then, yes, what was very, very, very tense, you know, too much strength. Then the jazz helped me, helped, helped me a lot because when you, are, you have, when you have to play jazz and fast, fast music, you don't have time to think in your fingers. You are thinking more in the music and it, it makes your bud and fingers and all to work better. It's, it's, it's very interesting. It really helps. It, it makes you to, it helps you to play freer, freer, more free, with freely, with more freedom. It yeah, I think so. Fingers fast. Uh -huh. Yeah, it makes total sense. Also because many times, you know, as bassoonists, uh, when you have to play something very fast, it's often Ravel, you know, the piano concerto. But then you have some some pieces in jazz that you showed us today with metronome mark on 190. Yes. You almost never see this in classical. <laughs> <laughs> and even more, even more. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there are, there is this, I don't know where, ah, I will show you. Charlie Parker, the Omni book, there are strange marks like 300. 320, for example, what is this? Ah, I don't find by not finding, but this is very common, this book. So how much is this? 220, right? 220, <laughs> yes. Correct. <laughs> yeah, the first time that I read this, oh my, and this. Oh, <laughs> 308? Yeah, 308. <laughs> exactly. No problem. <laughs> My metronome don't have this. It, it don't work for this. <laughs> so, so then it, what? Makes your, it makes you free. It makes you free. But it's also easy to, to play not very clean. Uh, that's the reason that I always doing the daily stuff, the daily practice with scales slowly, 80 BPM <laughs> every day. It's great. And also, um, Max, I think I got a question. Maybe you would like to add, uh, add something? We cannot hear you currently. Uh, two seconds. Okay, uh, I've got a question to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, while, you are, while you are improvising, what are you thinking about? It's like you've got many, many ways to uh, improvise learned, or it's like uh, impression for just now? No, yes, I already shared with the friends in the private, private, private lesson. Huh? Uh, actually, I practice with the composition technique. Né? When you use a motive and you work on this, né? because it's like a speech. You, you have a, a main topic, and to make sense, you have to develop this topic, né? go further in this topic. And if you just speak aleatory words, it, it it makes no sense, no? no? It's like a language that you, you will not, not understand. It don't make logic. But to improvise, I like to, to, to follow this, this way of, of uh, the composition technique, né? using a motive and then uh, speaking about any one, one topic. Né? For example, if the if the, the tune is, is sad or is, if it's happy, and it depends too of the, the name of the tune, né? it, it's, it's, an, it's an history. Né? It, should be, it should make sense. Né? There are many, many players that just play aleatory notes and just fast. For me, it's, it, it don't have any meaning. The good, good jazz players speaks, uh, tells a good story. Right? 
Thanks. Yeah, I hope it it re answered your question. question. Uh, another one here is um, you were speaking about that. Uh, maybe it was in the private session actually that you were starting very early to practice jazz just after two three years, right? And uh, exactly. the question is, uh, how did you start? Was it any teacher that you were inspired by? Did you play mostly from listening with the air or did you play some transcription or what? How did you start? Yes, it was by accident. Uh, me and my former teacher at that time, we were looking for more methods to improve the technique. Né? Then we searched in a, in a music store some books for violin, for example, and trumpet, then flute. Then we met this book, Charlie Parker, Omni book. Yes. Me and my teacher, we don't know nothing about who was Charlie Parker and what is one book and what, what are these notes and 320 BPMs, for example. <laughs> then we bought this book and Yes, I was only three, year, three years on basso. Then I was curious about this and I started to play very square and oh man, what is this? That, that, that was when I started to, to have, uh, to have jazz classes. Uh, I searched for a private uh, teacher. It, he was a saxophonist very famous here in Brazil. And he, he treated me jazz, all of jazz improvisation and who I should listen to. And yes, it was like that. <clears throat> wow, that's very interesting. Thanks for sharing. Yes, I memorized in the beginning this book. I remember that I, I know even nowadays almost this complete book because the idiom of the bebop is here. You have to memorize this to learn the, the language. No? Of course. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, Carolina, we have a question. Uh, yeah, yeah. No. now can you hear me? Uh, so yeah, I have actually one question. Do you believe uh, that uh, incorporating some jazz scales and some jazz improvisation at the early stage of teaching instrumental music Bassoon, uh, do you believe it's good for kids or should we rather stick to what we have to all the basic major minor and then develop further? Or is it good to, I don't know, start with whole tones as well or some model scales? Yeah, it can be a very good idea actually because when you play just the major and the relative minor scale, it, may, it can be a little bit boring in the beginning, eh? maybe, but it's very important too to do, to do this. Maybe alternating with a blue scale, why not? It, it can be good. It, may, it could be more, more fun. It could make more fun to play. Eh? I don't have children as students, but well, why not? It, it could be a very good idea, actually. So maybe that's the next the blues scales for kids. Yes. <laughs> Great. That's the next book. <laughs> With a uh, fagotino né? in the cover. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> Contra fagotino. Yeah. Contra fagotino. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I see we are almost uh, close to one and a half hour. I almost uh, I'm embarrassed almost to keep you that long <laughs> i hope you are not bored <laughs> no, but uh, very happy to be with you here very good opportunity but, uh, to meet we you have been there. learning a lot and i would just like to say thank you so much and i think we're getting to an end of the meeting thank you very much wow very good pleasure to be here with you all thank you very much for the opportunity christian and Alex, thank you a lot to you all. for coming <laughs> It was a lot of fun. Yes. Oh. So to everyone on Facebook you. now, uh, I will uh, just close the live stream now. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for watching and for contributing with questions. 
it was wonderful to see you also active in the chat. So, bye-bye. Bye-bye, all. Thank you.